Please rewind this cassette. Hey guys, welcome to Box Office Addict, episode 102, I think. Yeah, 102. It's going to be really hard to keep track of the episodes anymore now that we're over 100. Back when it was like 27, it was really easy to uh, keep this going. Okay, this is going to be a quicker episode. I'm not going to do like another 45 minutes. Um, because mainly there's really only one movie to focus on here, which is the Invisible Man. And I guess the My Hero Academia movie, um, which did really well, but that's not surprising. And then how well the Impractical Jokers movie is doing. Although I will say, I think failure in the marketing department on that movie, because I'm finding out a lot of people didn't know this movie existed. And I do think this movie could have made a lot more money. I'm not saying it would have done jackass numbers, but... We're going to skip over a lot of movies that I just don't care about anymore. Like, I don't want to talk about Fantasy Island and all that. But we'll talk about Parasite real quick. Um, Parasite is at $232 million worldwide. It continues to just make more and more money. Uh, you, I, I just I don't know where it's going to end up. I feel like it's wrapping up soon. The Gentleman has passed $100 million. You know, this is really big for Guy Ritchie because you got to think, he just made... I believe this is Guy Ritchie, right? He had just come off Aladdin last year, which made a billion dollars, and then here he is returning to the kind of movie that made him famous in the first place, and it's doing really well. So he's just kind of having a nice run right now in his career. Um, and I think they're working on Sherlock Holmes 3 uh, in the near future, so good for him. Jumanji, The Next Level, is still a huge, huge hit at $791 million worldwide. I think it can reach $800 million. Um, it's definitely going to make like $150 million less than the previous film, but not that big of a deal. We'll move on to 1917, which had a 35% drop. Is that $362 million worldwide? I don't know if it can reach $400 million. It doesn't really need to on its $90 million budget. Um, and I'd say $165 million as possible. Uh, for a final total domestically. Impractical Jokers, they expand this to 1,900 theaters, makes another $3 million. Um, so that's pretty impressive. Uh, now, you know, you're saying like, well, wait, it made three million in a limited release, but it, the people did show up for it. Um, cause you got to think they probably don't even have $10 million in this movie. Now I think this film could have done with how successful the show is. I think this movie could have done $40 million or something like that. I think it could have done like 35, $40 million. I think they really didn't promote and put this out there in the right way, but it's still, a, I would say a success. Just because it's going to make you know some money, and then they're going to make money on home video, and then they're obviously going to have this on True TV at some point. Birds and Prey and the Fantabulous Bullshit of Harley Quinn is at 188 million worldwide on that 85 million dollar budget. This is not bouncing back um, like I thought it might. I mean, this is at 79 mil domestic. This won't even make 90 million dollars domestically as of right now, and if it does, it'll barely make that. To not make 100 million dollars, like. If this movie would have just done okay, let's say this movie would have made 125 mil domestic and like 300 million worldwide, and that's it, then everyone would have said, okay, well, it did okay. They didn't really make a lot of money off of it, but was it an outright bomb? But the fact that it's struggling to make 200 million is embarrassing for all parties involved. I really feel bad for the director of this because I feel like it was her real shot at, you know, like breaking out. And now this is just the shutdown. Um, it's a big hit to Margot Robbie's career. Uh, it's upsetting for anyone out there who wants to marry Elizabeth Winstead in more movies. Uh, this just, yeah, just all around, just a really negative thing for Warner Brothers. Um, and they're probably going to put less stock in Robbie at this point. You know, when she says, hey, I want to control what happens with the future of this. If I was Warner Brothers, I'd be like, we gave you your movie. It bombed. So now you're going to do what we want. You're going to wear the short shorts again and be in the Suicide Squad movies, and you're going to shut up. Um, that's what I would do at this point. She, I mean, it's like Todd Phillips. Like, let him do whatever the hell he wants until he fucks up. Bad Boys for Life, $4.3 million. Is that $197 mil domestic? Has passed over $400 million worldwide on a $90 million budget. Very successful movie. Uh, isn't done yet should should end up over 200 mil domestic easily here within the next week and uh, i don't think it'll make 500 million worldwide or even 450 but it's the highest grossing film of the franchise um so and the fact that they kept the budget low like there's an alternate universe where they would have spent 175 million dollars on this movie and this box office wouldn't look that good but luckily 
they didn't indulge like that. Uh, the anime movie of the year, I suppose. Well, I guess it would be the uh, the Shinkai movie, that weather one that made like two hundred million dollars. But uh, five million, five point eight million. This I would compare this to like the Dragon Ball Z thing, the uh, the Broly movie that came out recently, uh, where anime in the states is really starting to just be as big as it ever was. It feels like the '90s again. When Suncoast Video and Sam Goodies and everybody was getting VHS tapes of anime and was obsessed with it and the culture started to take over and cons, anime did not die off. There was this feeling in the 2000s that anime was declining. And then I don't know if it was the generation of kids who grew up on the anime in the 90s getting older in this uh, the last several years and they all just still love Dragon Ball Z and Gundam and Miyazaki and all that stuff. But... um. Yeah, anime in the States. I mean, back in the day, an, an anime movie opening... I mean, Spirited Away only made $10 million when it opened. You know, and that's as critically acclaimed and celebrated as a movie can be. And here we are now, movies are opening to $5 million. I mean, it's not great, don't get me wrong, but the fact that this movie's made $9 million domestically, I think is really impressive. Um, it just shows you that in, in the culture, I mean, if you go to a mall and you walk by all the stores, there's just anime stuff everywhere um, that, you know, it's it's growth in America has not been on the decline. And I think maybe one day we'll be to a point where anime is so huge in the uh, in the West that it'll actually be viable as a box office thing like that, that movies will come out and make money or shows will come out and make a lot of money and uh I mean, Netflix, I mean, think about how Netflix just focus so much on anime because there is money in it because the merchandising, that's the big thing. Uh, Call of the Wild, a drop they did not need, 46%, $13.3 million. I had a subscriber whose theory was is that Fox intentionally inflated the budget because they knew of the sell to Disney, but I, I that sounds ridiculous to me, but it's at $80 million worldwide. Honestly, all of this would be okay if this movie's budget was like $50 million. $60 million. This would be like decent box office as of right now, but uh, this is still not even close to a break-even point with that budget. That budget is way too high. This movie would have to make over $300 million to be considered a, a success, so I just don't see it happening. I don't even think they're going to make $200 million. Um, this was just a really, really bad handling of a budget. Um, I get if you want to pay Harrison Ford like $15 million. But I don't know why you spent a hundred and you know twenty million dollars on the rest of the movie. Sonic had one of its best holds so far, thirty-seven percent drop, sixteen point two million dollars. This is actually a really good hold, and Sonic's like churning along. It looks like it will make over four hundred million. I didn't even think about a release in China, um, which somebody brought up recently, and I do think it'll do really well in China. And in general, I think it'll do well in Japan and all that. Um, it's at one hundred and twenty-nine mil domestic. Uh, 150 seems to be a lock at this point, maybe even 160, 170, and it will make over 300 million worldwide. The question is, does it stop somewhere at like 375, or does it end up going over 400 million? I would say for this to be considered a a, a decent success, it would have to make over 400 million. I think for it to be a big hit, it would have needed to make over 500 million dollars, like you know 190 mil domestic and 500 million worldwide, which I don't know if it'll make or not, but. Um, I think 350 to 400, it'll be considered a success if the budget actually is 85 million. But I've read that the budget is much higher than that, that it's somewhere in like the 110 to 120 million dollar range. This is Jim Carrey's most successful film in several years. Um, and as of right now, it's the only video game movie that I could think of outside of like Mortal Kombat that actually is doing fairly well when you look at its budget and everything. It's not considered a major disappointment, like something like Prince of Persia. It made over $300 million worldwide, but I believe the budget for the movie was like $200 million. So it ended up not making any money. Okay, let's talk about the main film of the weekend. And I want to talk about the filmmaker behind it, Lee Winnell. You know, it's very interesting when you go back to Saw and how significant it is with all these years passing. You know, you have James Wan direct it and Lee Winnell write it and star in it on a budget of $1 million, like a million and a half dollars. Movie makes $100 million worldwide. And they make like eight Saw movies. Um, and I, I, I've i heard Tarantino's a fan of the Saw franchise. I like several of the Saw films. I like Saw 3. 
uh, quite a bit. I think the first film's really good outside of the horrible acting and the plot twist not making any sense. But it's a really fun thriller. It was clearly influenced by Seven. And I think that Lee Winnell and James Wan didn't get enough credit at the time. They did from horror fans. Uh, people that were genre fans, I remember at the time, were like, hey, these guys are like, you know, these guys created a new slasher icon, a new horror icon. And they created a new franchise. But the thing is, James Wan, you know, kind of was like not really bringing it as the years went on. You know, he he didn't have some films doing that well. He had that Kevin Bacon movie. And then he also made uh, the puppet movie that didn't do very well. And then, you know, he comes out with The Conjuring, huge hit. Uh, before that, Insidious does really well. Him and Lee Winnell team back up again. Then The Conjuring is a huge movie. The next thing you know, Insidious 2 is a big hit. Then he gets Furious 7. Then he's doing uh, Conjuring 2, huge hit. All these movies are making like over $300 million worldwide. Then he gets Aquaman, $1.1 billion. Now James Wan's like one of the top directors in the industry. Lee Winnell, on the other hand, comes in to direct and write Insidious 3, which I think has one of the better screenplays of the franchise, but he doesn't seem like a very good director. Technically, that movie's not very well made. Then he comes out with Upgrade, which is was my second favorite film of that year, and I love Upgrade. And uh, Upgrade gets a lot of critical acclaim, uh, instant cult favorite, but doesn't do very well at the box office. Only has a $5 million budget, gets released by Blumhouse, but doesn't even make like $30 million. It still feels underrated as time goes on. But the big thing was Lee Winnell is a director. Like, wow, the cinematography to this movie, the way he does the action scenes, overall, just the camera work, the everything he did with it, the editing, it was just so much more polished. So then the thinking was, well, Lee Lena Winnell has some chops. And this is a dude that's been in the industry now for, you know, 20 years. These guys have been around for like, you know, about 20 years. And now here he is with finally his film um, that is a huge hit. Now, Insidious 3 did really well, but this is his big thing where he gets the critical acclaim that, that James Wan would get for one of his movies like The Conjuring. This film has 91% on Rotten Tomatoes. This movie only cost $7 million dollars which is the thing that blows my mind about it the most. You think about they did the Mummy movie with Tom Cruise that cost $130 million. They did the Dracula Untold movie. They were going to do a Jekyll and Hyde. They had this whole cinematic universe, and none of it did well. All those movies bombed. And then here we come out with a reinvention, a, a new look at The Invisible Man, where it's, you know, it's, it's a horror movie set in the Me Too era. And... Man, they just marketed this right. They kept the budget low. I mean, I was shocked. I thought this movie looked like it cost 15 to $20 million. Um, it's very impressive, although granted Upgrade looked amazing for $5 million. Uh, for a $7 million budget, Universal, this is what they always needed to do. They needed to go back to the roots of what the Universal Monsters and Horror was about. They should have made a Dracula movie that was a lower-budgeted film that, that, what, that did something really unique with it. They should have made a Mummy movie that didn't cost a hundred million dollars. It was an action film. This is the first one to actually treat it as low budget horror, uh, a monster movie, if you will, and actually have more going on than set pieces um, and a subtext. So that was a big deal here. Uh, you could tell this movie was going to do well just from the hype around it, the week going into it, the tracking was going up, 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 and up. And then here we are now with a twenty-eight million dollar opening in thirty-six hundred theaters, seven million dollar budget. 30 mil domestic so far, 50 million worldwide. Already, I would say this film is a success. This film is definitely tracking to make 90 to over 100 mil domestic, if not more. And I think the limit, sky's the limit here. This movie could make over $200 million worldwide. I mean, this is Lee Winnell's conjuring. This is his moment um, where he's going to go from a guy that's very respected in the industry, everyone knows him, he works, to a guy that's going to get bigger projects now uh, because this is a major success. And the fact that he can make movies on such a low budget. Um, I mean, if he can do all this for this kind of money, imagine if somebody gave him $30 million and said, just go crazy. So, yeah. I mean, it's it's a it's a big, big uh, success. I mean, this is this was a big surprise. You know, there, there was a lot of horror films that were hyped up in the last year or two that have really disappointed when horror was really making a huge comeback over the last several years. But this feels like the place we were at. Now, I think people maybe are over-hyping this a little bit, because is it shocking that a known property like The Invisible Man with a recognizable actress 
um made 28 million dollars opening weekend like people i think because they're, they're thinking it through the context of all those other movies bombing but those other movies actually did open to similar numbers and they just had huge budgets i think if you take out the seven million dollar budget like if this movie costs like 45 million dollars you wouldn't be seeing it this way it's like well i think the ip brought in a lot of people it just also so happened to be that this is a well-reviewed movie and it's a low-budgeted film so it looks like a bigger success because of all of those factors. Um, but I'm not actually as surprised as other, you know, analysts are where they're like, I can't believe this movie opened so well. I don't think it's that surprising. I think the biggest surprise, though, is that the film is being received so well after the opening to where it looks like it could actually make some serious money down the road where it's not going to drop off after, a you know, opening weekend. Like it's going to continue to do well like something like The Conjuring. So kudos to Lee Winnell, kudos to Universal, who really make lower-budget films like this. It's it's a great... I mean, shit. You know, you think about Doctor Sleep and how Mike Flanagan, they gave him $50 million, you know, and it just doesn't bring it in. And it's like, you know, I, I get it, but it, a lot of times with horror, uh, it's sort of like comedy, the more money you give it, you know? Like, I think about all the great comedies that i loved especially from guys who i really don't like anymore like when i really like you know adam sandler jim carrey movies from the 90s or that the movies didn't cost a lot of money like happy gilmore and all that and now they make these 80 hundred million dollar movies and they're just not funny um i think horror is a similar thing i think the more money you give it i think if you make big budget horror films um you lose something and i think keeping the budget low makes you have to be more creative within that genre and i think it just always seems to play better. Most of the most of the most successful horror films of all time, and there's exceptions. Don't get me wrong. The Exorcist had a pretty decent budget when it was made, but films like Texas Chainsaw, Nightmare on Elm Street, the Friday Thirteenth franchise, Halloween, um, a lot of these movies were not films that that had millions of dollars put into them, and they scared people more. Uh, so I think there definitely is something to that, and uh, I think this movie only costing seven million dollars was probably one of the best things about it because i think that made lee winnell have to really work on the screenplay and the emotional weight of the film and uh he couldn't rely on special effects which i think a a bigger budgeted film with a lesser director they would have really relied on the special effects it would have been like hollow man even though i enjoy hollow man for what it is uh, i think that's what this would have ended up being instead of being a film that people seem to be really into let's see if we're missing anything do little oh my god just fucking horrible release. 217 million worldwide, but with that budget. Think about it. That movie probably would have made that same amount of money with a $50 million budget. And if it had been set in the modern day. I totally believe that. Let's see if Little Women's passed uh, 200 million. It has Little Women's at 203 million. I would say that's just a major success, that movie. Rise of the Skywalker is at 1 billion, 73 million. It will not reach 1.1 billion. Big disappointment all around. Uh, this is like the Star Trek Into Darkness to Star Trek for J.J. Abrams from Force Awakens to this. It's very similar. Uh, where he has all this hype and momentum and then he makes the next film. Uh, Frozen 2 seems to be done at $1.4 billion. Yeah, I don't see anything else that's made a huge splash. Uh, let's see if Jojo Rabbit's at like $90 million, maybe. $88 million. So Jojo Rabbit looks like it'll wrap up at like $90 million, $92 million. A uh, modest success. Oh, look at this photograph. $1 million this week and 62% drop. Fantasy Islands at $24 million. Um, Let's see. I think Knives Out's still at just like $307 million. Yeah. Knives Out's pretty much wrapped up too. Although th that domestic total of $164 million. Jesus Christ. That movie way overperformed. Um... Let's see if Ford v. Ferrari made any more money internationally. It's pretty much at the same place it was at. I'm shocked Ford v. Ferrari didn't do better internationally. I just thought that film would make like $150 million. Um, you know, I did, I, I, I'm actually really surprised. I thought the whole car thing and all that would play all over the world really well. And just two big movie stars together. But I guess movies really aren't sold on movie stars anymore. Um, Uncut Gems is about at uh, 50 million. It might even be there. 
yeah, it's about to make fifty million, which would make it A twenty four's biggest film domestically. Um, so good for the Safdie brothers and Adam Sandler on that one. Uh, it, the international release is all on Netflix, so that's why you're not seeing any international numbers. But the film's budget was twenty million, so I'm sure they're happy with that total. Um, definitely wasn't a bomb. All right, so yeah, the story of the weekend: Invisible Man was not invisible to audiences. They went to go see this motherfucker. And uh, it's a huge hit. So, yeah, Universal wins the weekend. And Paramount sticking in there with Sonic. And Sony's doing good with Bad Boys. Um, so what we're not seeing right now is Disney and Warner Brothers and that uh, in there right now because they don't have any major release out there right now. Um, and then, if, well, I guess Call of the Wild is technically Disney, Disney, but they didn't produce that movie. It was already in production. So there you go. I'll see you guys for episode 103.